Hello, everybody. It's so good to see everyone. I am Wendy Singer, and I am Director of Education at the Illinois Holocaust Museum and Education Center. On behalf of our CEO, Susan Abrams, Board of Directors, staff and volunteers, I would like to I would like to welcome you to our virtual program this evening. The mission of the Illinois Holocaust Museum and Education Center is expressed in our founding principle, remember the past and transform the future. The museum is dedicated to this by preserving the legacy of the Holocaust, by honoring the memories of those who were lost, and by teaching universal lessons that combat hatred, prejudice, and injustice. Tonight, we are fulfilling this mission with an incredibly compelling program. Join us as author Lawrence Douglas presents the incredible book, The Right Wrong Man, John Demyanyuk and the Last Great Nazi War Crimes Trial, sharing the incredible story of the last major Holocaust trial, trial to galvanize world attention. Lawrence Douglas teaches in the Department of Law, Jurisprudence and Social Thought at Amherst College, where he holds a James J. Grossfeld Chair, a graduate of both Brown and Yale Law School, Professor Douglas is the author of seven books, including the widely acclaimed The Memory of Judgment, Making Law and History in the Trials of the Holocaust, and two novels, The Catastrophist, a Kirkus Best Book of the Year, and The Vices, a finalist for the National Jewish Book Prize. His commentary and essays appeared in Harper's, The New York Times, The Washington Post, The Los Angeles, and The Guardian, where he is a contributing opinion writer. Lawrence Douglas has lectured throughout the United States and in more than a dozen countries, and now he has entered the realm of Zoom travel. I had the honor and pleasure of hearing Lawrence present at the Jewish Foundation for the Righteous Alfred Lerner Fellowship Program last summer. And I was so riveted by his talk and I read his incredible book that I had to invite him here tonight to see all of you. After the presentation, there will be a live Q&A question and answer session. We will be taking questions through the Zoom chat feature. If you are new to Zoom, you can hover your mouse on the bottom of your toolbar and screen. Please click on the chat icon and send questions to me privately. I am IHMEC Wendy Singer. I will be sharing questions with Lawrence during the Q&A portion of the program, and we will get to as many questions as possible. Um, Without further ado, I introduce the wonderful Lawrence Douglas. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Wendy, for that uh, incredibly generous uh, introduction. I should say it's a particular pleasure to be able to uh, address the, um, the Illinois Holocaust Museum and Educational uh, Center. Uh, my wife actually comes from, she grew up in um, Winneka outside of Chicago. She went to the great New Trier High School and she did want me to emphasize that the Boris Johnson-like haircut that you see was not her doing. I carry the full responsibility for that. Um, in talking about the Demyanyu case, I actually want to start with a, uh, a story about memory. And uh, this is a story that comes from Hamburg in the mid uh, 1970s. Uh, in Hamburg in the 70s, German prosecutors, uh, they tried a number of SS officials who had run a camp called uh, Triniki. Um, the Triniki camp had been an SS uh, facility. It was located outside of uh, Lublin, Poland. Uh, and during the Holocaust, the SS had recruited about uh, 5,000 Eastern Europeans, uh, largely Ukrainians, not exclusively, uh, not exclusively Ukrainians, but about 5,000 of them uh, to be trained as death camp guards. And a famous uh, Triniki alumnus is uh, John Demyanyuk, about whom you'll hear uh, more in a bit. Uh, so in 1975, these German prosecutors, they tried a handful of, of SS men, 
who had run this uh, Triniki training facility. And during the trial in Hamburg, uh, a Jewish survivor of the camp, uh, this is a woman who had since immigrated uh, to the United States, she returned to Germany to testify. And this survivor recalled that one of the worst SS men uh, that she had encountered at the Triniki camp um, was an Obersturmbahnführer named Klink. Now, the only problem was that the prosecutors had never encountered the record of a lieutenant, of a lieutenant colonel Klink at Triniki. And in fact, they were perplexed by the odd name because Klink sounds German, but it actually isn't. And it came out in the course of the trial that the survivor had apparently confused her Triniki tormentor with a, a different man. Uh, those of you of a certain age will recognize this man as the bungling monocled colonel who presided over the fictitious Stalag 13 in the American sitcom Hogan's Heroes. And in the survivor's mind, uh, Colonel Klink of TV became confused with the Lieutenant Colonel of Tradiki. And she insisted that the two looked a great deal alike. Now, I begin with this story because I think that far from idiosyncratic, it signaled a central question that animated all the trials of the Holocaust. And the question was, what role should a uh, survivor memory play in these trials? Many of you will uh, recognize this photograph of the Nuremberg trial. Uh, it shows the 21 members of the Nazi state and military leadership who were uh, placed on trial before the International Military uh, Tribunal. Um, Nuremberg was not in the first instance a Holocaust trial. Uh, actually, the main charge that was brought against the 21 major Nazi war criminals was that they had committed crimes against the peace. Uh, that is, they had launched a war of aggression in violation of international law. Uh, nonetheless, uh, Nuremberg did confer judicial recognition on what they called crimes against humanity. And this was the term that was first introduced and pioneered at Nuremberg to describe state-sponsored atrocity. And this, this new legal category of crimes against humanity, um, it provided a, a pretty useful legal category for prosecutors to enter evidence of the extermination of the Jews. And they actually did a pretty impressive job of, um, of documenting the uh, destruction of the European Jews. Yet the prosecution's treatment of that topic did suffer from serious shortcomings. And the shortcomings had less to do with what the prosecution said about extermination than how they went about saying it. Now, this picture is also from the Nuremberg trial. It's certainly far less famous uh, than our previous image, but in a way it's even more uh, revealing. To prove the guilt of the accused, Nuremberg prosecutors chose largely to avoid relying on eyewitnesses to Nazi atrocity. Uh, these prosecutors were worried that Nazi crimes were so extreme that survivor testimony might be dismissed as exaggerated or perhaps even entirely uh, fabricated. And so what the prosecutors did instead is they structured their entire case around captured Nazi documents. And these captured documents were considered by the prosecutors harder, um, more reliable than eyewitness testimony. So Nuremberg turned into what I'll call a trial by document. Uh, it was a case that was largely absent the lived memory of eyewitnesses. In this photo, what we see here, the sea of documents, uh, we see the sea of documents that the allies had to wade through in preparing their case. And I think we could even say that on a deeper level, uh, the photo captures the very nature of this allied prosecution, which as I've said, sought to condemn Nazis with documents of their own making. And yet the photo also hints at what ended up being a really unforeseen, unfortunate consequence 
of this trial by document. Um, the famous uh, English writer and journalist, uh, Rebecca West, uh, she attended the Nuremberg trial and she wrote a famous account of the trial. And in this famous account, Rebecca West described Nuremberg as a, quote, citadel of boredom. And uh, West wrote that this was not run of the mill boredom. She said it was boredom on a grand historical scale. And this might strike us as deeply paradoxical. I mean, after all, this is the first international criminal trial in human history. It involves notorious defendants accused of spectacular crimes, and yet it proved colossally boring. And alas, the dullness of the trial was a direct consequence of the fact that prosecutors spent most of the court time simply reading thousands upon thousands of documents into the official record. Uh, this next image uh, comes from the trial of Adolf Eichmann in uh, Jerusalem in 1961. And Eichmann, as I suppose many of you know, uh, Eichmann served as the principal logistical mastermind of the deportation of European Jews to uh, death camps. Um, he fled to Argentina at the end of the war. Um, there, outside of Buenos Aires, he was captured by agents of Mossad, and he was brought uh, back to Israel to stand trial. And this photo of Eichmann, it's, uh, the, the quality of the image is uh, not perfect, but I think you can see this is kind of this iconic image of Eichmann sitting in a glass booth. And it's probably the most famous uh, image that's associated with Holocaust trials. And the, air, the Israelis actually constructed the uh, glass booth as a security measure for Eichmann. Uh, it was actually designed to protect him from uh, assassination uh, attempts. But the photo projects something altogether different, I think. Uh, it's as if the glass booth was designed to protect Eichmann uh, from the trial spectators. Um, it almost looks like a, a shield that's um, instead, that is rather than looking like something that's designed to protect him from the spectators. It looks like a shield designed to protect the courtroom uh, from the accused. And this glass booth, the glass booth in a sense, it, it turned Eichmann into something of a, a specimen to be studied and observed as if he were a creature from a radically different uh, moral universe, which is how the Israeli prosecution uh, largely treated him. Now, this is a second uh, famous image from the Eichmann trial, though this one I think requires some uh, explanation. The prosecutors in the Eichmann case were determined not to uh, repeat the errors of the Nuremberg documentary approach. Um, they decided very consciously to structure their case around the testimony of Holocaust uh, survivors. Um, and they thought that by telling Holocaust history through the lived memory of survivor witnesses, uh, that the trial could, and this is a, uh, a line from the uh, chief prosecutor, at the Eichmann trial, uh, a man named uh, Gideon Hausner. Uh, Hausner hoped that by telling Holocaust history through the memory of uh, survivors, he could create a compelling living record of the Holocaust. And in a sense, uh, Hausner's approach succeeded in a manner that frankly astonished him and other uh, Israeli officials. Uh, the trial riveted the attention of the Israeli public and it also uh, attracted a huge international audience, uh, particularly in West Germany and in the United States. Um, there was a great Dutch writer named Harry Mulish, and uh, Mulish attended the trial, and he described the power of the survivor testimony in these words. He said, as the witnesses spoke about events from their past, this history became real to those who listened. And I think that's what we see here in this image. Um, we see the past made present. We see the power of the memories of the unseen witness registered on the face of the uh, move to tears uh, spectator. The Eichmann trial then um, dramatically showcased the uh, power of organizing a Holocaust trial around the lived memory of survivors. But the dangers 
the dangers of basing a trial on traumatic memory were exposed in the other great Holocaust uh, trial staged in Israel. And this was the trial of John Ivan Damjanyuk uh, that began in Jerusalem in 1987, about a quarter of a century after um, Eichmann had been uh, executed. Demyanyuk, as uh, some of you might recall, uh, he was a native Ukrainian. Um, after the Second World War, he emigrated uh, to the United States. He became a naturalized US citizen. Uh, he settled in suburban Cleveland. Uh, he went to work for Ford, raised a family. And then in the mid 1970s, American investigators came to identify Demyanyuk as a former death camp guard, and not just as any guard, uh, Demyanyuk was alleged to have been Ivan Grozny, or Ivan the Terrible of Treblinka, a guard who had been notorious for his sociopathic cruelty. For technical jurisdictional reasons, uh, American prosecutors couldn't uh, try Demyanyuk domestically um, for crimes that, after all, had been committed against Jews in Europe. Uh, but what American prosecutors could do is they could charge Demyanyuk with lying on his citizenship application. And in so doing, they could then strip him of his citizenship and send him to a trial, uh, send him to a country that could try him. And after a rather long and uh, drawn out uh, legal process, Demyanyuk was denaturalized. And then he was extradited from the United States to Israel. And beginning again in 1987, he stood trial as Ivan Grozny, Ivan the Terrible of Treblinka. Uh, like the Eichmann trial, the Demyanyu trial was based on survivor testimony. Uh, in fact, the prosecution's case against Demyanyu was almost exclusively based on the eyewitness testimony of a handful of uh, Treblinka survivors. And these survivors all swore with absolute certainty uh, that Demyanyu was none other than Ivan the Terrible, their former guard. This image here, which is a little um, unclear, uh, but this is probably the most famous as photo associated with Damyanyuk's Israeli trial. Uh, it captures a dramatic moment when Treblinka survivor, right over here, this uh, Eliyahu Rosenberg identified the defendant, you can see him standing uh, right over here, and asked, um, by the prosecution, whether he could uh, identify the uh, defendant, uh, Rosenberg had said, I would like to see his eyes. And to inspect more uh, closely, Rosenberg actually uh, left the witness stand, approached the defendant, and then while staring at him, you see him staring quite intensely, said, I say unhesitatingly and without the, the slightest doubt, this is Ivan from the gas chambers. I see his eyes, those murderous eyes. After 18 months of trial, Demyanyuk was convicted and he was actually sentenced to death. And had he been executed, had he been executed, he would have joined Eichmann as the only uh, other person uh, to be executed in Israeli uh, history. Yet the conviction, um, yet while the conviction was on appeal, it became clear that Eliyahu Rosenberg and the other survivors at Treblinka that they had identified the wrong guy. Uh, Ivan the Terrible, it turned out, had been a different Ivan named uh, Ivan Marchenko, who was another Ur uh, Ukrainian, who bore a small but not entirely negligible resemblance uh, to Damyanya. And from the evidence that uh, came out during the appellate phase, it appeared that this, uh, that this Marchenko had died um, in the Balkans towards the end of the Second World War. Suddenly then, the photo of Rosenberg staring into the eyes of Demyanyuk uh, took on a very different meaning than from when it was first publicized. At the time, it was an image of the power of indelible memory to serve as a means of legal evidence and reckoning. Now, ironically, it stands as an image of the slippages of memory, of the unreliability and the undependability 
of eyewitness testimony, even eyewitnesses uh, of the most extreme uh, horrors. Now, oddly enough, the evidence that cleared Demyanyuk of being Treblinka's Ivan the Terrible was not entirely exculpatory. In fact, it showed that Demyanyuk had been a death camp guard only at a different death camp, uh, Sobibor, not Treblinka. Uh, nonetheless, um, Israel had tried Demyanyuk as Ivan the Terrible of Treblinka, not as Ivan the, we could say, not so hot, of Sobibor. And so in a brave and uh, necessary step, in 1993, the Israeli Supreme Court threw out Demyanyuk's uh, conviction. And thereafter, Demyanyuk returned to the United States for complicated reasons. He uh, briefly had his American uh, citizenship reinstated. Uh, this led to another long uh, denaturalization proceeding. Um, and in fact, this earned a Demyanyuk the dubious distinction of being the only person uh, in American history to be stripped of his citizenship not once, but twice. Uh, after yet more delay, uh, Demyanik was finally deported uh, from the United States to Germany. In fact, he arrived in Germany almost exactly uh, 11 years ago. It was uh, May 12th of uh, 2009 that he arrived in Germany. And then beginning in November 2009, uh, he was tried in Munich. And this time, he was tried for his service in Sobibor. Uh, he was convicted in 2011, and he died um, in 2012 as his case was being appealed. Uh, this was a photo that was taken from the very first day of Demyanyuk's uh, trial in Munich. Um, as we see here, the 89-year-old defendant, he lies flat on his back, and he is seemingly dead. The photo tells a disturbing story the Germans have seemingly put a corpse on trial. Now, this photo, this photo was carefully staged by the defense. The defense sought to attack the legitimacy of the trial by casting Demyanyuk as a frail and sickly scapegoat. Uh, the prosecutors of the case, they immediately asked the court uh, whether there was any real medical necessity for Demyanyuk to be uh, displayed like a corpse. This turned on the very first day, in the very first minutes of the trial, into a vehement argument between the defense and the prosecution that resulted in something of a uh, Solomonic uh, compromise. Uh, Demyanyuk would be allowed to remain on his uh, hospital gurney, but he would have to be propped up at a 45 degree angle. And I think one of the things that this, uh, that this photo reminds us of is that in today's media saturated world, um, high profile trials inevitably will become competitions, uh, uh, will become competitions over images uh, that as much as anything that happens in the courtroom itself, these images will come to define our collective memories of the trial. This is a photo that was taken toward the end of Demyanyuk's 18-month uh, uh, Munich trial. And this was shortly before his conviction in uh, May um, 2011. And he was convicted as an accessory um, to the murder of 28,000 Jews, again, during his service at Sobobor. And obviously here, um, this picture presents a very different image of the defendant. Um, gone is the corpse-like uh, trial, the, the, the corpse-like display that we saw on the first day. Uh, now we see a more characteristic uh, expression of the defendant. Uh, he's detached, uh, emotionless, in fact, really kind of vaguely defiant. And it delivers, I think, a pretty powerful emblematic image of the remorseless, unapologetic uh, perpetrator. Now, I actually want to talk about a kind of a legal um, detail of that trial. And I just mentioned that uh, Demyanik was convicted as an accessory, as an accessory to murder. And that requires a little bit of comment. Um, the crimes of the Holocaust gave rise to two novel categories in international law, crimes against humanity on the one hand and uh, genocide on the other. 
Uh, I've already mentioned that crimes against humanity were first uh, recognized and successfully uh, prosecuted at Nuremberg. Uh, genocide happens to be the term that was coined in 1944, relatively recent coinage, it was coined in 1944 by Ralphie Lemkin. And Lemkin was a, um, a Polish Jewish refugee uh, who had come to the United States and who at the time was working as an advisor to the US War Department. And uh, that is when he coined the term uh, genocide to describe what was happening to the Jews in, uh, in Axis occupied Europe. And genocide became recognized as its own um, separate international crime in 1948 with the framing of the UN uh, Genocide Convention. So crimes against humanity and genocide together have supplied the charging instrument um, for many successful Holocaust trials. Uh, for example, um, they were used in, some of you might be familiar with the trial of uh, Klaus Barbie, the so-called Butcher of Lyon. Uh, they were also used as the charging instrument, for example, of the Eichmann trial that we just discussed. Germany, however, Germany insisted that because crimes against humanity and genocide were only recognized as crimes after the war, that it would be unconstitutional, that is a violation of the bar against retroactivity, that it would be unconstitutional to try former Nazis for these crimes. Now, I'm not gonna go into a lot of um, legal detail about how German courts arrived at this very problematic conclusion. But as a practical matter, what it meant was that the very charging instruments that had been designed for prosecuting Nazi exterminators, again, crimes against humanity on one hand, genocide on the other, that these charging instruments were for German prosecutors, they were off the table. Uh, so what German prosecutors did instead is they just relied on the ordinary German murder statute. And basically all um, Holocaust trials that took place before German courts uh, relied on the ordinary murder statute in Germany. Now, that might sound like, sure, what's the problem with that? But unfortunately, the need to pigeonhole um, Nazi atrocity and these state-sponsored crimes into the ordinary murder statute created very, very substantial complications for uh, German prosecutors. Uh, for one thing, German law held that in order to um, convict a former SS man as a perpetrator, or even as an accessory to murder, the state had to prove that this SS uh, fellow had killed with his own hands. So in cases in which an act of individual hands-on killing could not be proved, successful prosecution of an SS exterminator was basically impossible. Now, it goes without saying that the very efficiency of the SS's killing operations uh, guaranteed that there were very few survivors who could perform such a testimonial function. And in fact, the need for a survivor to testify in detail about a specific act of hands-on killing that he or she had witnessed simply in to prove that the accused had been an accessory to murder. This basically made uh, German post-war prosecutions of thousands and thousands of guards impossible. Uh, Demjanjuk's Munich trial marked a historic, though I think we should add belated, break with this uh, problematic case law. And the prosecution in Munich faced much the same problem that had disabled thousands of these earlier uh, German cases. So while the prosecution had very strong proof that Demjanjuk had served as a guard at Sobibor, it had absolutely no evidence whatsoever that Demjanjuk had killed with his own hands. In fact, I think we could go even further and say that they had no evidence at all about Demjanjuk's specific conduct uh, or behavior while he was at Sobibor. But the prosecution got around what had been a major obstacle to prosecute in all these earlier cases by developing a rather simple and brilliant theory that bypassed the whole question of survivor memory entirely 
and instead turned on the testimony of professional historians. And the argument had the simplicity of a kind of logical proof. And the prosecutor's argument went like this. They said, all Sobibor guards participated in the killing process. Demyanyuk was a Sobibor guard, and therefore Demyanyuk participated in the killing process and had to be convicted as an accessory. Now, the beauty of this argument lay in its uh, insistence that the court could convict Demyanyuk as an accessory to murder, even in the absence of evidence that Demyanyuk had killed with his own hands. So let's just look a little bit more closely about how they managed to make that argument. So that second premise, that Demyanyuk had served as a guard at Sebobor, um, as I've said, that was solidly established with uh, documents and evidence. So that could be established beyond a reasonable doubt that he had served at Sobibor. But it's that first premise uh, that all Sobibor guards participated in the killing process. Now that, that might sound like a pretty straightforward statement, but in fact, it's actually a historical claim um, that could only be proved with a rather comprehensive understanding of Sobibor, of how Sobibor functioned, and of the functions of these uh, Trinity trained guards like Demyanya. And so the Munich trial turned into what I'll describe as a trial by professional historians. And these historians who were called as expert witnesses, they established two critical facts. Uh, first, they established that Sobibor was a death camp. Now, this was hardly headline news, news but in a moment, we'll, we'll come back and see its relevance. As a second matter, uh, the historians testified that all guards at Sobibor were what they called generalists. Now, Sobibor was a very small camp. Uh, the entire supervisory force at Sobibor uh, comp was comprised of only about 15 to 20 SS men and about another 100 to 120 of these uh, Trinici, uh, Trinici trained guards like uh, Damiania. Um, so as a bare bones operation, these historians were able to uh, testify that all the guards were mobilized when the train loads of Jews arrived. Uh, some served uh, in the guard tower, while others manned the uh, train ramp and they ran this very well rehearsed um, process of destruction. Now, now, this historical testimony was crucial because any suggestion that, let's say, some guards worked exclusively as uh, cooks or exclusively as launderers, uh, this might have fatally weakened the prosecution's argument because, again, the indictment turned on not what Demiano did personally because they didn't really know exactly how he acted on a day-to-day -day basis, but on the function that he must have uh, performed by virtue of having been a guard at Sobibor. Now here the uh, historians drew a very telling comparison to Auschwitz. Um, Auschwitz, I think in our mind, is the paradigmatic um, uh, SS uh, destruction site, uh, but Auschwitz actually was a hybrid facility. It was part death camp, but it was also part slave labor camp. Um, and so of the 1.2 million uh, persons sent to Auschwitz, about 100,000 uh, survived. Now, if we think of Auschwitz as a disease, and obviously in the midst of this pandemic that, is, uh, that we now find ourselves in, um, we tend to think about things in terms of lethality rates. And if you have 100,000 survivors out of 1.2 million people, you're talking about an exceptionally lethal place. Uh, you're talking about a death rate of over 90% at Auschwitz. <clears throat> but nonetheless, compare Auschwitz to the about 1.7 million Jews who were sent to the extermination facilities of Treblinka, Belzesh, and Sobibor. Of the 1.7 million Jews who were sent to those three camps, 125 survived, a death rate of 99.997%. So in the case of Auschwitz, it was possible that some of the 6,000 guards that had been there may not have directly participated in the exterminatory process. 
But in the case of Sobibor, the prosecution was able to argue that that would have been impossible. Sobibor had one purpose and one purpose only, and that was to murder Jews, and the entire supervisory force participated in that largely successful effort. So by establishing that Sobibor was a killing machine and that all the guards participated in the killing process, um, it no longer became relevant whether they had killed with their own hand. The court was then able to conclude that Demyanyuk must have participated in the killing process itself. And so it convicted him of being an accessory to murder and sentenced him to uh, five years in prison. And he actually died in a nursing home while his appeal was pending. Uh, but I think his conviction nevertheless marked an important correction in a German case law. Because after decades of legal missteps, uh, the court in Munich finally concluded that when it comes to state-sponsored atrocities, like uh, the murder of the Jews, the guilt follows function. And that was the simple and the great insight of the Damianuk uh, conviction. And yet at a trial in which uh, historians essentially supplanted the voice of survivors, many of the observers at the uh, Munich trial still very much had this desire to hear the words of lived memory. And if not from uh, the survivors, then at least from the perpetrator himself. And so as the, uh, the trial drew to a close, many of these uh, persons expressed um, the, really the kind of the fervent hope that Demyanyuk, uh, who had remained stubbornly silent through the entire course of the 18 month uh, proceeding, that he would finally uh, speak. A lawyer for uh, families of relatives um, who had been murdered at Sobibor addressed the defendant directly at the very end of the trial. And he said, Demyanyuk, use this last chance to break your silence. It was not to be. Asked by the presiding judge at the end of the trial, if he would like to make a final statement, Demyanyuk muttered a single word in Ukrainian. Nah, no translation was necessary. So I think that ends uh, the formal uh, part of uh, this evening's presentation. And I look very much forward to a, a spirited uh, question and answer period. So I am happy to um, entertain your questions. And I'm not sure if they are going to be, uh, if you're going to be asking them directly or if they are going to be, um, uh, if Wendy is going to be serving as the moderator of this. Yes, I will be yes. asking the Terrific. question. So just to remind everyone, if you do have a question and we have a lot already coming in, please go to the bottom of your screen. And if you hover your mouse over the bottom toolbar, you will see a chat function. Please message me privately. I'm Wendy, I'm I-L-H-M-E-C, Wendy Singer. Um, so thank you for for everyone who has questions already coming in. Um, let's start with this question, Lawrence. Why do you think it took German prosecutors nearly 70 years, a very long time, to convict a collaborator like Damianyuk? Yeah, it's a, it's a terrific question. And um, the uh, answer is um, both complicated and simple. Uh, the simple part of the answer is that the German judiciary was stacked with former Nazis um, in the decades right after the war. Um, the, uh, it's estimated that about 80% of the German uh, judges, for example, in the state of Bavaria were former um, Nazis. Uh, and you have uh, former Nazi judges occupying the very highest echelons of the legal hierarchy in Germany. You have them on what is the equivalent of the German uh, constitutional court, on the court of uh, highest administrative appeal. And clearly it is the case that these uh, judges uh, and jurists had very little stomach for a uh, very aggressive um, uh, 
post-war trial program. Um, the thing that makes things a little bit more complicated is that this decision or this, um, the fact that the German prosecutors had, as I mentioned, to rely on this murder statute, it really was a very grave complicating fact, uh, factor. And it is no doubt that even though you have these jurists who had a Nazi pass and had very little interest in a robust uh, reckoning with Nazi crimes, it's also clear that you had prosecutors who despised the Nazis and in the post-war period were extremely aggressive and eager to try to bring uh, Nazis to trial. Um, but unfortunately, uh, this kind of some of the, the statutory strictures that I tried to articulate made it very, very difficult uh, for them to succeed. And um, again, you might say that, um, you know, better late than never, that they finally kind of framed the right kind of legal theory that permitted the conviction of a collaborator like Demyanyuk. On the other hand, you could turn around and say, well, isn't it ironic that they basically had to wait until virtually all the perpetrators had died off before they arrive at the uh, proper legal uh, instrument. So one can be both um, impressed by the work that uh, some German jurists um, uh, dedicated themselves to, at the same time, you can be appalled by the uh, obstacles that others erected. Thank you, Lawrence. And a question to follow up on that is, we know that John Demyanyuk was an older man, but how how was he the one that they picked out of everybody that that was charged with this? How did they find him and why him? Well, there, there's no doubt that Demyanyuk um, was uh, tried in Germany because of his Israeli trial. That is, again, I, I don't, um, I have to say my, my heart doesn't exactly bleed cold borscht for John Demyanyuk because after all, he was a, um, a death camp guard. Um, that said, the only reason that he really was on the radar of German prosecutors was because of this notoriety that was associated with his previous trial in Israel where he really was misidentified with a very notorious figure. Uh, one of the things that, uh, again, that I tried to argue in the book is uh, we have no reason to believe that in contrast to this Ivan Grozny at Treblinka, we have no real reason to believe that Demyanyuk uh, behaved in a particularly cruel fashion at Sobobor. We have no reason not to. We just don't have any evidence one way or the other. But I think that's what made his uh, conviction all the more distinctive and important, that if you're a death camp guard, it doesn't really matter how you're behaving. By definition, you're an accessory to murder. But again, it is the case that the reason that the Germans ended up putting this 89-year-old on trial was largely because of the notoriety that uh, continued to be associated with his name from this uh, earlier um, trial in Israel. Well, to follow up on that, thank you, is how did they find him the first time, how did how did the whole thing start? Um, Cleveland's a large Ukrainian community and and how, how did it all start? Uh, yeah, it started in, in, in a somewhat um, interesting way. Um, the a Ukrainian, um, actually a Ukrainian communist passed on information that was actually, ultimately it was, it was uh, passed on to a, a Jewish American senator from New York, uh, Jacob Javits. And this uh, Ukrainian communist passed on a list of um, alleged um, camp guards who were living uh, completely unruffled lives in the United States. And the Soviets had tracked some of these guards pretty well because all the files that came from the Trinity uh, camp and that came from all the death camps, remember all the death camps were really in the eastern part of uh, Europe. Uh, we kind of think about the Americans liberating Dachau but all the camps, you know, Madonic, Auschwitz, they were all liberated by the Soviet Union. So the Soviets had a tremendous amount of uh, documents. And actually, they weren't trying to be particularly nice to the United States. It wasn't as if they were like, 
oh, let's help American prosecutors by giving them a list of former um, death camp guards who are now living happily in the United States. In fact, what they were trying to do is they're trying to embarrass the United States. And they were also clearly trying to, at the time, this is in the mid 70s, around 1975, they were trying to drive a wedge between the Ukrainian community in the United States and the Jewish community in the United States. Because both the Jewish uh, and the Ukrainian community were very anti-Soviet at the time. Uh, many of you would recall that the issue of uh, the treatment of Soviet Jews was a very important issue for the American Jewish community. And also the, uh, the American Ukrainian community was highly nationalistic and, uh, and anti-Soviet as well. And so what the Soviets were trying to do is try to drive a wedge between the Ukrainian Americans and the Jewish Americans by now publicizing, by sharing with a senator mm -hmm. uh, the list of uh, alleged um, former camp guards who were now living in the United States. Thank you, thank you, very interesting. Um, we have a question um, that popped up. Can you speak about the prosecutor Cornelius Nessler in Munich, who was an attorney in the German prosecution? Yeah, so um, Cornelius, was um, the uh, German trials, uh, this is something I found fascinating. So I was, uh, I originally covered this trial for Harper's Magazine. Uh, so I got, got to play as a professor, I got to play journalist. And then I took my a reportage of the trial and turned it into a book. And uh, one of the things that was fascinating for me was to see how different German trial procedure is from American trial procedure. And one of the distinctive differences is, um, the actual prosecutors at a German trial, they don't play much of a role. They, um, they present the indictment, and then they basically sit there mute for much of the trial. And uh, in fact, the, uh, the lawyers um, who performed what we might describe as a pros prosecutorial role were lawyers who were retained by families of, um, persons who had been murdered at Sobibor. These tended to be uh, children or even grandchildren of people who were murdered at Sobibor. And what German law permits is they permit victims' families to intervene as kind of, we really don't have a term for this in American law, kind of as a civil plaintiff. And Nestler, uh, Nestler was one of the uh, lawyers who was representing the uh, victims' families um, from Sobibor. And uh, Nessa was a very good lawyer. He's actually a, a professor as well. He's a professor of criminal law. And um, I happen to also, I think I can, can uh, mention this now, that um, he was incredibly helpful to me because just coincidentally, he had actually read something that I had written about Holocaust trials. And so um, whereas other journalists were kind of clawing and scratching to get certain documents from the prosecution, uh, Nestler early on said, just bring your computer to my hotel room. We'll hook it up to each other. And he gave me, basically gave me about, you know, 100,000 pages of files from the prosecution's case, which proved very helpful in writing the book. But uh, Nestler was a very uh, impressive um, uh, lawyer. Thank you. Um, on, the, on the discussion of the German, um, the case in Germany, how many perpetrators were tried in Germany? and how many were convicted? Um, so uh, I guess we have to kind of uh, distinguish a little bit about what we uh, mean by Germany. So I was really focusing in my comments about uh, the Federal Republic of Germany, the country we now call Germany. I really wasn't focusing so much on East Germany. East Germany actually, um, before its collapse in 1989, East Germany had done a pretty substantial number of um, Holocaust prosecutions. Now, unfortunately, some of those Holocaust prosecutions had the quality of somewhat of a Stalinist show trial, but um, other trials that were conducted in East Germany, they tended to be uh, pretty impressive. Uh, in the case of West Germany, uh, what then became the, you know, just Germany, um, there were, so uh, there were about 120,000 cases that were investigated by German investigators. Of those 120,000 cases that were investigated, only about 6,000 went to trial. And of those 6,000 that went to trial, there were about 600 convictions. So not an entirely impressive number. 
Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, we have a comment and um, a question. By the time of the German trial, Germany had signed the ICC statute and crimes against humanity and genocide and genocide should have been available to them, even if not under domestic statute. Though the punishment might have been the same, the statement to the world would have been much different. When the case was still in the US, wasn't it quite controversial, even inspiring the ACLU to defend him? Um, well, first of all, just uh, this again, a little bit of a legal technicality. So the ICC is the International Criminal Court. And the International Criminal Court is an institution uh, that was created in The Hague uh, on July 1st, uh, 2002. And it is responsible now for trying uh, perpetrators of crimes against humanity, genocide, war crimes. Um, as a technical legal matter, um, in order to encourage people to sign on, in order to encourage nations to sign on to the uh, ICC, something which many of you might know the United States has uh, not done, we are not a member of the International Criminal Court, uh, Germany is, but in order to encourage states to sign on to it, the statute of the International Criminal Court has only what's called prospective jurisdiction. That is, it has jurisdiction only over atrocities committed after the establishment of the court. Again, July 1st, 2002. So the court would not have had jurisdiction over uh, the Demyanyuk um, case. Uh, so that just is a narrow technical matter. Um, to the question of uh, American defenders of uh, Demyanyuk, I mean, he did have uh, you know, many vocal defenders in the uh, Ukrainian uh, community, many def uh, vocal defenders in the Ukrainian community. He also had vocal defenders in the form of, you know, some of you uh, no doubt recall the name Pat Buchanan. He was the um, White House uh, spokesman uh, for Ronald Reagan. He also ran for president. He was a very passionate a defender of Demyanyuk. And I would say some of his passionate defense also started straying in the direction of uh, anti-Semitism. And uh, in fact, Demyanyuk, uh, you can rather notoriously compared, I think he described the legal travails of Demyanyuk as the gravest travails that anyone has faced uh, since Christ at Calvary. Not sure if I would entirely accept that analogy. Thank you, Lawrence. We only have time for a little bit more, but I want to tell the audience that when we end the program formally, if you want to hang on for a little bit and ask some questions um, to continue, because we're getting so many questions, with, which is great. Um, I have to ask this question um, that um, I want to make sure to get in. What is your thought or impression of the Netflix series that came out that you were in and we, I saw you many times in and I wanted to, uh, um, along with some others, we wanted to get your take on that series. Right. So in many ways, I thought it was a very impressive uh, documentary. I thought they did their homework really well. Uh, there was footage actually um, in that documentary that I hadn't seen in uh, research in the book. So I thought um, they did, um, that Yossi and his team did a really nice job. That said, uh, it was a Netflix documentary. And I think the Netflix documentary, in order to kind of hook the uh, viewers, they made the whole thing somewhat of a mystery. Was this guy a guard? Was the guy not a guard? There's zero doubt about that. A, it's clear that he was not Ivan the Terrible of Treblinka, and it's equally clear that he was Ivan the Not-So-Hot of Sobibor. That is very clear. And so the way the, um, the uh, documentary structured its narrative, I thought was a little bit misleading. Of course, the other thing that you can also, you know, you get interviewed for whatever, nine hours for a documentary or something like that, and then you see the little clips that they use, and then you're going like, wait a second, but that's not the point you should be making that I made. I made a much better, more important point. So it's always a, an instructive lesson into how we're not able to control the images uh, of ourselves that end up circulating in the wider world. 
Yes, thank you. I, we, there were a lot of people who asked this question. Um, it seems that this recent conviction is an example of how extensive the Nazi regime had orchestrated control and power into our current times. Do you foresee more Nazi war trials? Are there any last trials that are currently in process? Um, so um, there were a couple of uh, trials that took place um, after the, um, the Demjanic uh, conviction. Uh, there was um, <clears throat> this uh, Oskar Groenig, the so-called uh, bookkeeper of Auschwitz or the accountant of Auschwitz, uh, he was tried and convicted uh, based on the same uh, theory that the Demjanic prosecution relied on. And also there was a second conviction of Reinhold Hanig, who's also an SS officer at um, Auschwitz, who was convicted under the same uh, kind of theory of functional participation that was used in the Demjanic prosecution. Um, my own feeling is, and, and the German prosecutors uh, continue um, to try to bring cases. Obviously a lot of these cases run up against um, rather bleak actuarial realities. I mean, these uh, perpetrators would have to be at the very youngest in their um, mid to late um, 90s. Uh, so my own feeling is there probably will not be any more convictions uh, that we'll see after these convictions of um, Hanig and uh, Gronig. But I do think actually that it was important that the last Holocaust trial didn't end with the conviction of a Ukrainian collaborator, but actually ended with convictions of actual SS men. Thank you so much. Um, one, one last question we have time for since we have a couple minutes left. And again, we invite anyone who wants to hang on after this last question um, to hang out in our lobby, if you will, and stick around um, to ask some additional questions. So our final questions, um, the final question that we'll ask is, how did the Treblinka survivors in Israel come to misidentify him? They, they seemed so certain that that was the man, um, Ivan the Terrible. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, and that's also, a, a, it's a great question. And, um, and again, the, the answer is going to be, I hope it doesn't get uh, confusing the answer. Um, the Israelis, there's no doubt that the Israeli police uh, made certain mistakes in their identification parades. These identification parades, we're probably all familiar with this from having watched uh, police dramas where they put, you know, photograph, but they don't actually have people lined up. In this case, you're not lining people up, but you have photographs of uh, persons and you ask the, um, the persons to identify people in the photograph. Well, one thing you never do if you're gonna have an identification parade, if, if you know that, um, that the uh, accused uh, went prematurely bald, you don't have just one picture of a bald person and everyone else with kind of thick and luxurious hair uh, because the, um, the witnesses inevitably are gonna go for the person who's bald. The other thing that seems unmistakably the case is that after the first uh, Treblinka survivor identified Demyanyuk, um, they discussed that identification with other Treblinka survivors. So other Treblinka survivors arrived at the Israeli police in a way almost um, already prepped to identify Demyanyuk. And one of the things, if you go back and look at the protocols of that identification parade, is you see people becoming more certain of the identification um, as they re-encounter the picture. And that's also problematic because what at that point you can't really tell if they're remembering the actual person photographed or if they're remembering their act of already identifying that photograph. And so it's very clear that, you know, you look at the protocols and they're like, yes, this one could be him. The next time we're going to ask you again, is that him? That's definitely him. Next time, I could swear on a thousand, that's absolutely him. 
Uh, in the book, I actually tried to describe all, some of the, of the missteps, some of them which are pretty severe, that the Israelis engaged in, in these uh, identification parades that I think really kind of made it almost inevitable that these, uh, dumb, that these Treblinka survivors would engage in misidentification. Thank you so much, Lawrence. Um, we're going to close our formal program, um, but we want to thank everyone for joining us. Um, we see people from all over and um, it's hard that we have to do things virtually now, but it's also an opportunity. And we see people from all over the US who's, who have tuned in for your, for your um, presentation. Um, I want to let everyone know that this is the book to remind you. It's in the title of our program. They are available on um, Amazon.com. Um, it's an incredible book, incredible read. Um, so I encourage you to check it out. Um, coming next week, we have another virtual program. And for all the attorneys out there, pay attention. There are CLE credits available. Um, and it's an incredible program called The Role of Judges, Attorneys, and Bar Associations During the Holocaust um, with um, Professor Kathy Lesser Mansfield. So that is next week, Thursday, May 21st. Um, please join us. Thank you for coming. And uh, we wish everyone a wonderful evening. And um, we will see you again soon virtually and hopefully soon in person. And Lawrence, thank you again. Um, for those of you who want to hang around, um, we'll just wait a moment for those who are saying goodnight to leave and we'll, we can answer um, a couple additional questions. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. All right. So thank you, Lawrence. Um, we have some people who are hanging on and I'm gonna ask some of the other um, questions that came up. Um, so um, one of our audience members, who's a wonderful docent of ours, um, is from Cleveland. Um, and I think you may have answered a portion of this question before, but um, just in case, if you could give a little clarity, um, there's a huge Ukrainian community there as well as a Hungarian community. How did he get singled out among all those former Nazis and members of the Hungarian Arrow Cross? Arrow Cross? Um, I'm sure there were plenty of them in Cleveland. Um, so again, um, you know, it's, it's estimated that there were thousands of um, Nazi collaborators who ended up emigrating to the United States. Um, and um, obviously only a fraction of them were ever brought before um, denaturalization proceedings. And, um, you know, as I, as I mentioned, the way Demyanyuk and actually a bunch of other guys got on the radar of uh, American prosecutors was because he just happened to be on this list that the uh, Soviets had shared with, um, uh, with Americans that was then passed on to this uh, Jacob Javits, this American senator who then passed it on to the Immigration and Naturalization a service and uh, and again maybe this is more than that was asked but one thing that became interesting was um, the Justice Department ended up creating its own separate bureau for handling these cases um, at first the uh, immigration naturalization service seemed to be very pretty uninterested in going after these former collaborators they were like who what do we care so they're in the United States they're now living these lives leave them alone and, um, and it was really the work of uh, Congresswoman Elizabeth Holtzman. She pushed very, very hard to make sure that American um, uh, investigators and prosecutors did everything they, good, uh, everything they could to bring denaturalization proceedings. And uh, she really pushed for the creation of the separate bureau within the uh, Justice Department uh, called the Office of Special Investigations. Um, that was responsible for bringing these denaturalization uh, cases. And without that, um, without the energies of uh, Holtzman and a few others, uh, it's probably the case that um, Demyanyuk and thousands of others, or, or many, many others, would have continued to live uh, perfectly um, unruffled lives uh, in the United States. Thank you, thank you. All right.
I'm going to ask some more questions. And if I miss something, because there were so many guys, just put it back in the chat, because I'm not sure who is still here and who isn't. So I want to make sure whoever's here, we get it answered. Um, all right, here is, here's, here's an interesting one. Why were the few major American companies who served the Nazi, Nazi regime never prosecuted at all, including, including GM, Ford, and IBM? Um, of whom it seems used concentration camp slave laborers and built war machinery and arraignments for the, Jew, the uh, German army, as well as other important support? Um, well, you, you know, again, as a, as a technical legal, legal matter, you don't usually bring criminal charges against uh, corporations. So um, corporations aren't, uh, you, you could probably um, sue them and uh, but what you'd really be doing is you'd be suing, in many cases, their, um, their affiliates abroad. And if anyone has, um, has followed the uh, history of Holocaust litigation involving things like reparation and compensation, you know that a lot of these suits did go forward. Um, you have you know, many suits that were brought forward in the United States, actually, that were bringing uh, against um, you know, German corporations, also suits that took place in Germany uh, involving uh, insurance companies. You have the very famous cases involving, you know, Credit Suisse and the Swiss banks. Um, so it's not as if these, uh, these companies entirely escaped uh, liability, but they certainly were not brought up on criminal charges. Uh, in Germany, uh, actually the one company that was kind of almost treated as a criminal uh, was this IG Farben, was this uh, chemical company. Uh, IG Farben also kind of notoriously produced the Zyklon B that was then used in uh, death camps. Um, and uh, members of the, of the, um, the IG Farben um, company, they were brought under, up on criminal charges by the allies in uh, companion cases to the big Nuremberg trial. Um, but I think as a general proposition, we can say that the reckoning of corporations, again, was quite belated and uh, never really took the form of criminal prosecution, alas. Thank you, thank you. Uh, from another one of our fantastic docents. Um, hi, Jack, nice to see you. Um, any idea why Israel had such a huge show trial with the enormous number of people in the gallery? Um, so again, one of the things that I, I, that I think I tried to say about both the um, Eichmann trial and the Damiani trial is that it's very clearly the case that the Israeli prosecution were using these cases as pedagogic tools. Now, I wouldn't say that they were show trials because I think the term show trial has this uh, resonance with Stalinist fraud trials. So these trials were certainly properly conducted trials but they clearly were trials that were meant to, as I said, with respect to the Eichmann case, they really were meant to rivet an audience. And it's not accidental that both the Eichmann trial and the Demyanya trial took place in reconverted, uh, retrofitted auditoria. That is, the Israelis actually took an auditorium because they wanted to get a lot of spectators in. And, um, and that's why the trials took place in those venues. And not only did they take place in front of pretty substantial number of live spectators, but in the case of the uh, Eichmann trial, uh, it was broadcast on Israeli radio. Israel actually didn't have live television at the time of uh, 61. And in the case of the Demyanya uh, case, it was um, broadcast on television. So it really was meant to be kind of a, um, sort of a national spectacle of Holocaust uh, instruction. It worked very well in the case of the Eichmann trial, and it sort of blew up in the face of the prosecution in the Demyanya case. Okay, thank you. All right, we have another question here. We're only gonna take one or two more. So if you had a question that I did not answer, um, please put it in the chat, because I'm not sure who's, who's still here. Um, the question and comments are here. I'm curious about the role that statutes of limitations play here. I have no sympathy for war criminals, but I am concerned that anyone would be made to answer for activities from five or six or seven decades ago. I imagine 
exculpatory evidence could easily be lost over time. And as this case proves, witness testimony is often troublesome in, the most of, in most of the recent cases, much less after 50 years. Excellent question. Um, so statute of limitations, well, just again, as sort of as a narrow technical, uh, as a technical legal matter, um, crimes against humanity, genocide, there is no statute of limitations for those crimes, no statute of limitations at all. So that means that, again, you could try someone 70 years after the fact. In Germany, in Germany, the, uh, the ordinary murder statute that I described was used as the charging instrument in all these uh, post-war trials, that uh, German uh, murder statute actually at the time um, had a 20-year statute of limitations. That, at the time, that is, at the end of the war, had a 20-year statute of limitations, which meant come 1965, German prosecutors would not have been able to try anybody in Germany for anything related to uh, the Nazi era. And in fact, in 1965, there then was this, I mean, you think of statute of limitations as a fantastically boring area of law. And in fact, in 1965, because the statute of limitations on murder was about to expire for Nazi era crimes, there was this passionate debate in the German Bundestag, the German uh, Congress, about the extension of the statute of limitations. And it ultimately was uh, extended uh, first in a kind of stopgap fashion, and finally, uh, the statute of limitations for murder was also abolished. That's the kind of narrow legal answer. But there's a kind of a much deeper sort of moral question that, the, uh, that your uh, questioner was uh, bringing up, which is, you know, is it fair to bring up uh, these charges so many decades after the fact? And one of the things that I think your uh, questioner asked was, you know, is in the case that exculpatory evidence uh, might... Um, might be lost in you know, these decades later. One of the things that actually you see in the Holocaust trials, because you're dealing with state-sponsored crimes, is um, very often it takes a long time for prosecutors to get the relevant evidence. So it's not like an ordinary prosecution where you think, oh, the prosecutors get the best evidence shortly after the crime, and then the quality of the evidence erodes over time. In the case of Holocaust trials, and actually it's the case of them very often with these complex state-sponsored atrocities, it's often the case that you only get good evidence years later. Uh, in the case of Holocaust trials, in fact, uh, a tremendous amount of evidence only became available after the fall of the Soviet Union, because the Soviet Union were holding on to vast amounts of uh, incriminating uh, facts. Uh, very often you need to get a uh, cooperation from other states in order to get this, uh, this kind of complicated um, evidence of state-sponsored crimes. So the concern that we normally have about the erosion of the quality of evidence over time, I don't think actually applies uh, as well in the case of the state-sponsored crimes, which furthers, um, which strengthens the argument for continuing to permit um, these uh, trials to happen even decades later. If I can just long-windedly make one final comment about that, is I do think the fact that if you're trying someone 70 years after the fact, uh, needs to be taken into account when it comes to the punishment phase. And I thought the, uh, the German court in Munich uh, actually did a pretty, pretty brilliant job in that they convicted uh, Demjanjuk, uh, gave him a five-year sentence, but then immediately released him pending appeal. And so I think they engage in kind of more of a, a symbolic act of punishment uh, rather than any kind of real punitive gesture, which I think they realized would have been kind of unnecessary when the guy was already 92 years old. Thank you, Lawrence. We're gonna close with one last question because we're completely caught up and I can't help but ask this question because it's from retired attorney and father of myself, uh, Neil Reichabin. What, if any, responsibility did post-Nazi government take? What, if any, responsibility did post-Nazi government take? Um, <clears throat> so certainly the, uh, the German government has, um, has paid a lot of money 
to um, the state of Israel and to um, Holocaust survivors. Now, what's a lot of money? They have paid um, about 75 billion uh, euros from 1950 until now, 75 billion euros. So it's about 85 or so billion dollars. And um, sounds like a decent amount of money, but again, you know, it, it becomes one of these grotesque sort of calculations when you start figuring out the value of uh, human lives. And it is the case that um, some of this uh, money, I mean, some of the money, it was called Vida Gutmachungsgeld, which literally means making good again money, which sounds again sort of grotesque when you're dealing with this type of, um, with these crimes of genocidal uh, scope. Um, but it certainly is the case that Germany, you know, if you've traveled to Germany today, you'll see that the government has made a very aggressive attempt to memorialize the atrocities of the Third Reich. Um, a number of years ago, my family, uh, we were living in Berlin and uh, we were visiting a lot of these memorials that had been erected in, um, in the city of Berlin. And I, in fact, I remember I was walking with my son who, uh, older son who at the time was only about 14 years old. And I said, oh, what's that across the street? And he said, dad, I'm sure it's just another memorial to atrocity. And it, it kind of captured something about the German reality that they really have done a pretty responsible job of trying to reckon with their past on the level of education, commemoration, memorialization, and then also a bit compensation. Not so good when it comes to criminal prosecution. Well, thank you. Lawrence, thank you for your insight. You're brilliant and um, we're so glad we got to share it with our um, museum community. Um, thank you for everyone for coming. This will be posted on our YouTube website. It takes about a week. Um, so anyone who wants to review it again or share it with friends and family, um, it will be there. Have a wonderful evening and hope to see you again soon. Thanks all. Thanks again, Wendy. Thank you. Nice to meet everyone. Bye-bye.